Hello there. I'm Taryn, and welcome to my newly revamped channel. I'll be reading Dave Duncan's series, A Man of His Word, starting with the first book, Magic Casement. To tell you very briefly about the author, he's 84 years old, and he was born in Scotland. After university, he moved to Canada, and in his 50s, he began writing. Fun fact about Dave, he's written 60 novels. <laughs> And that's six more novels than King's written to date, and in a shorter amount of time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. This isn't counting scripts, short stories, and other things the King's written. Now, this is one of my favorite books of all time. Even higher on my list than, here it comes, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. Which I find, get this, I may be blasphemous, it's boring in parts. I love this book mainly because of the great characterization, the well-paced action, and to this day, it still has one of the most unique magic systems I've ever heard of. It's got any sports in it? Are you kidding Fencing, fighting, torture, revenge, giants, monsters, chases, escapes, true love, miracles. This book takes place in the world of Pandemia, which is very loosely based on European and Middle Eastern areas. Before I begin, let's look at the title. Magic Casement. What is a casement? Well, basically, it's a window. Something like this. Here we go. This is an actual casement in an actual castle wall. So, now that I've established that, let's look at the map of Pandamia. We're starting here in Krasnagar, a kingdom that is basically one town where everyone knows everyone else. Troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. This book will be concerned with both Krasnagar and the city of Kinvale, here. Not a horribly large area, but the mountains here and here, snow and cold winters make for hard traveling. So, let's begin. Magic Casements by Dave Duncan For Janet, sine qua non. And that is actually... Latin for without which it could not be. Sine qua non is usually used as a legal term. But in this case, he's saying without his wife Janet, this book wouldn't be. Which is really sweet. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Keats, Ode to a Nightingale. Chapter 1 Youth Departs. 1. Since long before the coming of gods and mortals, the great rock of Krasnagar stood amid the storms and ice of the winter ocean. Resolute and eternal, throughout the long arctic nights it glimmered under the haunted dance of Aurora and the rays of the cold, sad moon, while the ice pack ground in useless anger around its base. That just sounds stunning, think frozen. In summer sun, its yellow angularity stood on the shining white and blue of the sea like a slice of giant's cheese on fine china. Weather and season came and went, and the rock endured unchanging, heeding them no more than it heeded the flitting generations of mankind. Two sides fell sheer to the surf, pitted with narrow ledges where only the crying seabirds went, but the third face ran down less steeply, and on that long, mad slope, the little town adhered as grimly as a splatter of swallows' nests. 
above the humble clutter of the houses, at the vast crest of the rock, the castle pointed black and spiky turrets to the sky. No mere human could have raised those stones in a land so remote or a setting so wild. The castle had been built long centuries before by the great sorcerer Iniso to serve as a palace for himself and for the dynasty he founded. His descendants ruled there still, in direct male line unbroken. But the present monarch, good King Hollandorn, beloved of his people, had but a single child, his daughter Inosalan. Summer came late to Krasnagar. When inhabitants of milder lands were counting their lambs and chicks, the brutal storms still rolled in from the winter ocean, while those lucky southerners gathered hay and berries, the winds and alleyways of the north lay plugged with drifts. Even when night had been almost banished from the pallid arctic sky, the hills ashore stayed brown and severe. Every year was the same. Every year a stranger might have given up hoping and assumed that summer was not about to happen at all. The locals knew better, and in patient resignation they waited for the change. Always their faith was rewarded at last. With no warning, a cheerful wind would blunder in to sweep the ice flows from the harbor. The hills would throw off their winter plumage almost overnight, and the snowdrifts in the alleyways would shrink rapidly to sullen gray heaps sulking in shadowed corners. Now, I for one would really hate this place. I'm a desert rat. I can't stand winter. I live in Utah and I still don't like the winters even though I've been here almost 20 years now. A few days rain and the world was washed green again. Fair weather following foul as fast as a blink. Try saying that five times fast. Spring in Krasnagar, the inhabitants said, had to be believed in to be seen. Now it had happened. Sunlight poured through the castle windows. The fishing boats were in the water. The tide was out. The beaches were clear of ice and obviously eager to be ridden on. Enos came early down to breakfast, busily spinning plans for the day. The great hall was almost deserted. Even before the fine weather had arrived, the king's servants had driven the livestock over the causeway to the mainland. Others would now be outside attending to the wagons and the harbor, cleaning up the winter's leavings and preparing for the hectic work of the summer. Enos's tutor, Master Poraganu, was conveniently indisposed with his customary springtime rheumatics. There would be no objections from him, and she could head for the stables as soon as she had grabbed a quick bite. Aunt Cade sat at the high table in solitary splendor, Momentarily, Enos debated the wisdom of making a fast retreat and finding something to eat in the kitchens, but she had already been noticed. She continued her porch, therefore, practicing poise and trusting that a regal grace would compensate for her shabby attire. Good morning, Aunt, she said cheerfully. Beautiful morning. Good morning, my dear. You're earlier than... Enos had not intended to make that last remark, but her breeches tried to bite her in half as she sat down. She smiled uneasily, and her sleeves slid quietly up her wrists. Aunt Cade pursed her lips. Aunts could be expected to disapprove of princesses arriving late at meals in dirty old riding habits. You appear to have outgrown those clothes, my dear. Kate herself, of course, was dressed as if for a wedding or a state function. Not one silver hair was out of place, and even for breakfast she had sprinkled jewelry around her neck and over her fingers. In honor of the arrival of summer, she had donned her pale blue linen with the tiny pleats. Enos restrained an unkind impulse to remark that Kate appeared to have outgrown the pale blue linen. Kate was short. Kate was plump and Kate was growing plumper. The wardrobe she had brought back with her two years ago was barely adequate now, 
and the local seamstresses were all at least two generations out of date in fashioning attire for ladies of quality. Oh, they'll do, Ina said airily. I'm only going along the beach, not leading a parade. Aunt Kay dabbed at her lips with a snowy napkin. That will be nice, my dear. Who is going with you? Kel, I hope, or Ido, or Fan. Rab, of course, had long since departed from the mainland. So had many, many others. Kel will be helping me? Cade frowned. Ido? Not the chambermaid. Enos's heart sank. It would not help to mention that Ido was an excellent writer and that two of them had been, already been out six or eight times recently in much worse weather than this. There'll be somebody, she smiled. Thanks, at Old Nook as he brought her a dish of porridge. Yes, but who? Cade's china blue eyes assumed the tortured look they always did in these confrontations with her willful niece. Everyone is very busy just now. I shall need to know who's going with you, my dear. I'm a very competent horsewoman, aunt. I'm sure you are, but you must certainly not go riding without suitable attendance. That would not be ladylike or safe. So you will find out who is available and let me know before you leave. Restraining her temper, Enos made noncommittal noises to the porridge. Yeah, I've made those noises plenty of times myself. Mm. Kate smiled with relief and apparently with complete innocence. You promise, Enos? Trapped. Of course, Aunt. Such babying was humiliating. Enos was older than Sela, the cook's daughter, who was already married and almost a mother. I am having a small salon this morning. Nothing formal. Just some ladies from town. Tea and cakes. You would be very welcome to join us. On a day like this. Tea and cakes and Burgess's fat wives? Enos would rather muck out the stables. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? Disaster. There was no one. Even the youngest and most inadequate stable boy seemed to have been assigned duties of world-shattering importance that could not be postponed. A frenzy of activity possessed anyone still remaining in the castle, and there were few of those anyway. The boys had gone to the hills or the boats, the girls were busy in the fields or the fish sheds. There was no one. No one of her rank. That was the real problem. All of Enos's friends were the children of her father's servants. But Krasnagar possessed no nobility below its king and no minor gentry either. Unless one counted the merchants and burgesses, her father counted them, Aunt Kate did so unwillingly. But servants and gentry alike, the boys were vanishing into trades, the girls into matrimony. There was no one around with leisure to escort a princess, and the prospect of that spirited gallop along the sands began to fade like a mirage. I love it. Krasnikar sounds just an absolute picturesque place. I could see it in a painting. Something like this. We all know, of course, it's not going to last forever. It can't or there would be no story. The stables were almost deserted by man and beast both. As she went in, Enos passed Ido, bearing a bundle of washing on her head. Looking for Rap? Ido inquired. No, Enos was not looking for Rap. Rap had long since gone landward with the others and would not be back before winter. And why should everyone always assume that it had to be rap she wanted? She spent a wistful time while a grooming lightning, although he didn't need it. What he needed was more exercise. She had inherited lightning from her mother. And if her mother had still been alive, then they... Well, no point in thinking about that. As Enos left the stable, she passed old Honanin. The hostler, a gnarled and weather-beaten monument whose face seemed to have been upholstered in the same leather used to make his clothes. Morning, miss. Looking for rap? Enos snorted a denial and pranced by him, 
although snorting was not regal. And probably that way of departing was what the writers of romances would call a flounce, and that would not be regal either. She would not be able to go riding, and Aunt Cade would know she was still around the palace. Would she hunt down her niece to impose the tea and cake torture on her? With some relief, Enos decided that Aunt Cade probably wanted her at the affair no more than she wanted to attend. Unfortunately, Cade might decide that her duty required her to promote Enos's education and the social graces. At that point in her misery, Enos found herself out in the bailey. There was a wagon heading for the gate. She had promised Cade that she would not go riding alone. No one had said she could not go down to the harbor unaccompanied, or at least into the town itself. Not recently, anyway. Ah, we're already breaking the rules here. Bending, then breaking. The guard was the problem. The token sentry would not likely say anything, but nosy old Sergeant Thusselin liked to sit in the guard room and watch who came and went all day. He might consider that he had an authority to question Princess in Ocelon, even if he didn't. He probably would. She hurried across the cobbles to the wagon then strolled casually beside it as it clattered and jangled through the archway. There was just room for a slim princess to walk between the high rear wheel and the greasy black stones. The noise reverberated astonishingly in that narrow space. She was shielded from the guardroom. She marched past the sentry without a glance. A moment later, she was in the outer court, feeling like an escaped ferret. If the king could safely walk unaccompanied around the town, then his daughter could, yes? Enos did not ask the question aloud, so no one answered it. She was in no danger. Her father was a popular monarch, and Krasnagar was a very law-abiding place. She had heard tell of large cities where what she was doing might be foolish, but she was certain that she would come to no harm in Krasnagar, Aunt Cade might object that being unaccompanied was unladylike, but Enos could see no reason why her father's independent kingdom need be bound by the customs of the empire. A single wagon road zigzagged down the hill, but Enos preferred the narrow stairways and alleys. Some of those were open, some roofed over, some were bright and sunny, some dark Others parted lightly by windows and skylights. They were all steep and winding, and this fine day they bustled. Enos was recognized often. She received smiles and salutes, frowns and surprise glances, all of which she acknowledged with a confident and regal little nod, as her father did. She was growing up. They must expect to see her around more often in the future, and yet hurrying down the steep little town, Enos saw no one of any interest, only thick-shouldered porters and wide-hipped matrons, tottering crones and sticky-mouthed toddlers. None but the dull remained in Krasnagar in the summer. From time to time, she caught glimpses of slate roofs below her and the harbor below those. Two ships had arrived already, the first of the season, and there she was headed. Early arrivals always made Krasnagar nervous, for in some years they brought sickness that would slash through the town like a scythe. It was less than two years since one such epidemic had carried off the queen. But the harbor was where the excitement would be, where the fishermen and whalers of Krasnagar itself mingled with visitors come to trade, stocky, urbane ships captains from the empire, and the foreboding, flaxen-haired Jotnar of Nordland, tall men with ice-blue eyes that could send shivers down Enos's arms. She might even see a few sinister goblins from the forest, each leading a party of his wives, loaded with bundles of furs. Then Enos stumbled to a halt halfway down an open staircase. It was wide and sunny, it was deserted except for two women standing in conversation, but one of them was Mother Unonini, the palace chaplain. 
from the way the two were poised to move, they were just about to complete their check. If Mother Unonini looked up and saw Enos unescorted, she would certainly have questions to ask. A door opened beside Enos, admitting a woman with a package under her arm. Enos smiled at her, took hold of the door, and went in, closing it firmly in a tinkle of silver bell. The small room was lined by shelves, bearing rolls of fabric. The large lady in the middle was Mistress Mailorn. She looked up, hesitated, then curtsied. Rather flattered by that, Enos bobbed in return. She had come shopping, she decided, a most ladylike occupation to which no one, not even Aunt Cade, could possibly object. Your Highness is the only lady in Krasnagar who could wear this. I am. I mean, why do you say so? Mistress Mailorn beamed and bunched rosy cheeks. Because of the green, Your Highness, it exactly matches your eyes. Your eyes are exceptional. Remarkable. They are the key to your beauty, you know. I believe you have the only truly green eyes in the whole kingdom. Beauty. Enos peered at the mirror. She was draped in a flowing miracle of green and gold silk. Of course she had green eyes. But now that she thought about it, who else did? Imps like myself have dark brown eyes, Mailorn said, and Jotnar have blue. Everyone but you has either brown eyes or blue. Rap had gray eyes, but Mailorn could not be expected to know a minor palace flunky. Everyone else was either Jotun or Imp, one or the other. Imps were short and dark. Jotnar were tall and fair. In summer, Jotnar turned red and peeled disgustingly. Imps tended to sicken in winter. I neither am my mistress. I don't think I've ever thought of that. Enos's father had brown hair and brown eyes, paler than most, she decided. You're a diplomatic compromise, your highness, if I may say so. Your royal father rules both imps and Jotnar here in Krasnagar. It would be inappropriate for him to favor either one or the other. Enos was about to ask if that made her a half-breed, then thought better of it. Of course, the kings of Krasnagar could not be a pure strain. For generations, they played off their predatory neighbors by taking wives from first this side and then that. Normally, when Imp and Jotun married, the traits did not mingle, and the children took after either one parent or the other. But so many royal outcrosses had eventually produced a true mixture in Enos. She must remember to ask her father about it. How curious that she had never noticed before. She was neither tall nor short. Her hair was a rich, deep gold, not the flaxen of a Jotun. She did not peel in summer. Indeed, she took on a splendid tan. And she certainly did not pine in the long nights, as the imps did. She was a true Krasnagarian and the only one. The bronze for your complexion, the gold for your hair, and the green for your eyes, Mistress Mailorn murmured. It was designed by the gods especially for you. Enos looked again at that miraculous fabric that enveloped her. She had never owned anything like this before. She had not known that such material existed. What a gown it would make! Gold dragons on green fields and fall foliage. Wherever she moved, the dragon shimmered, as if about to fly. Aunt Cade would be ecstatic over it, and delighted that Enos was taking an interest in clothes at last. And her father would certainly not object, 
for she must expect to start playing her part in formal functions soon, as she neared her coming of age. She would ask Cade to advise her on the design. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, Ina said firmly. I absolutely must have it. How much is it? Two. No one had ever suggested that Mistress Mailorn might be a sorceress, but the thought occurred to Enos as she panted up the last alleyway that led to the castle. Three and a half gold imperials? How had she ever been bewitched into agreeing to pay so much for a mere swatch of silk? Aunt Cade would have hysterics. Aunt Cade must not be allowed to find out. The best strategy was certainly for Enos to go to her father at once and explain that she had saved him the trouble of choosing a birthday gift for her. True, her birthday was still some time off. I've been there, done that. Also true, he had never given her anything worth three and a half gold imperials. Not close, even. But she was growing up, and she needed such little luxuries now. Surely he would understand when he saw the silk itself and she explained why she had chosen it and why it was so suitable. He would be so pleased that she was beginning to take more of an interest in ladylike matters, wouldn't he? She had some jewelry of her own that she might be able to sell if she was able to sneak back into town again. She might be able to raise half an imperial that way. A straight three would sound a much neater, rounder sort of number. Father would understand, of course, that the only alternative was his dear daughter's tragic suicide from the highest battlements. Possibly she could live without the silk. She had managed so far, but she could certainly not endure the shame of having to return it. So he would congratulate her on her good taste and see to it that the money was sent as she had promised, wouldn't he? She reached the top of the lane and paused to catch her breath, and also to reconnoiter the courtyard. There was only one gate to the castle, and it opened into this cobbled outer court. Now, there was no wagon in sight to provide cover, only a few ambling pedestrians. The summer sun was high enough to smile in over the ancient stone walls, and brighten the pigeons that strutted around, cleaning up the horse droppings. Relics of winter snow bled quietly to death in the corners. A man-at-arms was standing as rigid as his pike beside the gate, with two mangy dogs sniffing aimlessly beside him. Within the big arch of the entrance, noisy old Dosselin would be lurking in his guardroom, it was none of Thusselin's business, she decided firmly. Whether or not he had the right to stop her going out, he certainly could not stop her coming in. She did not recognize the petrified man-at-arms, but he looked as if he were taking his job unusually seriously, and so would not interfere. She squared her shoulders, adjusted the silk below her arm, and began to march. She had every right to go into town by herself, and if she chose to do so in shabby old jodfers and a leather doublet that might have been thrown out by one of Inisa's stable hands, well, that was certainly not Thusselin's business either. She wondered who the guard on the gate was. He must be somebody new. It was not until she had almost reached the arch that... Rap! He rolled his eyes in alarm and almost dropped his pike. Then he came even more stiffly to attention, staring straight ahead, not looking at her. Inosalim bristled angrily. His cone-shaped helmet was too small, sitting like an oversized egg in the nest of his unruly brown hair. His chainmail was rusty and much too large. His very plain face was turning from brown to pink, showing up his freckles. What on earth are you doing? she demanded. I thought you were off on the mainland. I'm just back for a couple of days, he muttered. His eyes rolled warningly toward the guardroom door. Well, why didn't you tell me? She put her hands on her hips and inspected him crossly. You look absurd. Why are you dressed up like that? And what are you doing here? Why aren't you at the stables? Pudding, 
the gang had called rap when they were all small together. He'd had almost no nose then, and not much more now. His face with all chin and mouth and big gray eyes. Please, Enos, he whispered. I'm on guard duty. I'm not supposed to talk to you. She tossed her head. Indeed, I shall speak to Sergeant Thusselin about that. Rap never suspected a bluff. No! He shot another horrified glance toward the guard room. He had grown, even in the short time he'd been gone, unless it was those stupid boots. He was taller than her by quite a bit now, and the armor made him seem broader and deeper. Perhaps he did not look quite so bad as she thought at first, but she wouldn't tell him so. Explain, she glared at him. A couple of the mares had to come back. He was trying not to move his lips, staring straight through Enos. So I brought them. I'm going back with the wagons. Old Hononin had nothing for me to do with the ponies away. Ha! she said triumphantly. Well, you still aren't doing anything very much. You will take me riding after lunch. I'll speak to the sergeant. A mixture of fury and stubbornness came over his face wrinkling his wide nose until she half expected the freckles to start popping off like brown snowflakes. Don't you dare. Don't you speak to me like that. I won't ever speak to you again. They glared at each other for a moment. Rap as a man at arms. She remembered now that he had expressed some silly ambition to play with swords. It was an idiotic idea. He was tremendously good with horses. He had a natural gift for them. What good do you think you're doing standing here with that stupid pike? I'm guarding the palace. Ina snorted before she remembered again that snorting was not regal. For what? Dragons? Sorcerers? Imperial legions? He was growing very angry now. She was pleased to see, but he made a great effort to answer civilly. I challenge strangers. Looks like that was our time. There went my timer. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Come back three times a week as we continue to read more. Give us a like and please subscribe. If you like what I do and you find it worth it, please support me on my Patreon page. Links below. I hope to see you next time. Come and join us again. Bye.